series called This Is How We Turn the World Upside Down, and we've been going after our purpose statement, and I want us to say it together. Let's see how, how, how many people can look at me and say our purpose statement together. We are a spiritual family with a to make and to work for the peace and prosperity of our cities. Amen. So we're on this series called, series called This Is How We Turn the World Upside Down. That phrase comes out of Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. And in that story, Paul and Silas had made their way to a city, and the officials of the city said that those who have turned the world upside down, they've come here also. Today, my simple goal is that you might have confidence in the way that you've chosen, that you might have great confidence in the fact that you've said Jesus is Lord and I'm following after him. I want your hearts to be full and enriched and even to grow roots a little bit deeper to understand that the way that Jesus laid out for us is not just like another neat religion that just has a cross on it instead of a moon or a sickle. It's not just another option in the religions of the world. This is God himself who sent his son. And I think it, it's worth taking time to appreciate and to value some of the things that we do that could be so um, normal for us to hear, to hear the terms of pray and repent and disciple and believe and Christian, and these, these terms can begin to lose some of their strength with us. But I want to say this morning that our God has given us the best way forward. It is the absolute best response to everything that is going on in the world right now. Everything. And in 35 minutes, I can't give you as much as I would love to in maybe a two or three hour time when we actually took questions and talked about how practical, how uh, sensible some of the things he said, and then how brilliant some of the ways that he's given us to live are, and it's powerful. And so Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5, I've put this challenge out here, and I want to slow down a little bit today and teach at a different pace. Verse 3 through 5 says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. So how many remember me sharing the word meditate? Meditate. And I talked about the fact that the scriptures do call us to study the Word of God, but I think in our understanding it's necessary to use the term meditate. Meditate may be different than just memorizing scriptures in the Bible. Meditating means that I am processing the meaning of this text, and I'm going to sit here until it makes sense to me. Amen? A lot of people can uh, quote Bible verses, and some people won't quote Bible verses anymore. They'll quote the length of time they've been a Christian. But how many know your duration does not cast out devils? But he said, he that believes on me as the scripture has said, John chapter 7, out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. So there's things that I'm looking for in my life that if rivers aren't coming out of me, that means uh, I haven't believed. It doesn't mean I just haven't believed, but I haven't believed as the scriptures have said. And there's a difference. There's a lot of believing going on, but when the believing don't equal results, that's when we jump into the scriptures and we begin to meditate on what it said. Train up a child. Spo uh, train up your child in the way it should go. What is it? Spoil the child. What's that phrase? Y'all help me out, somebody. Spare the rod. Spoil the child. See, I, I threw it out so hard that I forgot what it said. 
I don't want you to raise your hand if you think spare the rod, spoil the child is a Bible verse, but it's not. Spare the rod is in the scriptures, but spoil the child is not. Amen? So there, over time, you can pick up terms. I remember when I started to study the name of Jesus, I decided to start praying for people without actually saying Jesus. Just to watch for results. Because I discovered that in the name of means in the character of Jesus. It's not an incantation. That's why sometimes it doesn't work. Amen? So you, you meditate on the word. You meditate on the word. Wherever you see a gap in results or product versus what you were expecting, there's a gap of meditation. There's a gap of sitting still and giving time to something because wherever we are all involved, all of us included, wherever man is involved, a lot of times our traditions, just things we say or things we heard growing up, and we have no idea what it means. Or our roots haven't had time to go and richly understand what it means. The way Jesus said was take heed how you hear, watch how you listen. Today, we are on the phrase, make disciples. We're on the phrase, make disciples. A global mission, a spiritual family with a global mission to make disciples. Can everybody say that with me? Make disciples. You can only make what you are. Amen. Amen? So we want to talk about being a disciple. We want to talk about the definition of a disciple. And in the end of this, I want your hearts to be filled with rest and hope to know that you have chosen the way that is rich. So, you know, we, we are facing so many things. You, you can just watch the news and you don't have to be a prophet to understand that the world is shaking. And, and if, you, if you go through the word, you'll recognize that the habits and behaviors that are being practiced in this country right now are the very ones that happen before a nation falls. It's not a secret. You don't have to be prophetic to figure it out. It's right there. You can read it in Numbers. You can read it in Leviticus. You can see that when a nation begins to do these things, then that's right before a deed transfer takes place and someone else is going to give the right. And you may not like what they, they believe. Amen? And so that's not to say that that's our ultimate end right now, just so I don't put y'all in anxiety, because there's always repent as a nation, repent as a church, repent as a people. And it's where uh, God comes along and he, he stops by Abraham's tent, his friend's house, uh, on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he stops there and he knows that Abraham's going to intercede before he destroys these two cities. And Abraham starts a, an intercession time with him and goes to say, if there's 50 righteous people, will you preserve the city? And then 50, 40, 35, 25, and he goes on down to 10. So there's still always the potential of his great mercy in any situation. Amen? Why is discipleship so rich? Why is it so powerful? I want to simply start off with some of the thinking around this. So Isaiah 43 through 5 tells us, bring the mountains down, lift up the valleys, make the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth, that there is a preparation for the Lord. There is a preparation for the Lord. God, I want you in my heart. God, I want you in my home. God, I want you in my marriage. God, I want you in my generations. I want to be able to fall asleep at the end of my life and know that my children, my children's children, and my children's children's children are all worshiping the Lord. Lord, that's what I want for my legacy. How many say amen to that? Is that what you want for your legacy? How many singles can say amen to that? Lord, give me a good sense of smell so I don't pick the wrong person. Amen? Amen. It starts now. But so, I, if God, I want you, I need to prepare for you. If I want you, I need to prepare. If I think you're so great, then I need to prepare like someone great is coming. Amen? And so, Isaiah 40, I want to take and show you where this is translated a little bit in Scripture. Matthew chapter 18, where this same concept is shown in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1.
Matthew 18 verse 1 says, about that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. I just read Isaiah 43 through 5. Do you see the difference? I want to pause. I just want to pause. So I want to show you how Jesus built everything he said off of the scriptures. So what I just read to you was another version of Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. And in that translation of the idea of bringing mountains down, exalting valleys, crooked places straight, rough places smooth, in that example of humility, he says, be like children. Now, he said nothing about children in Isaiah chapter 40, but in Matthew chapter 18, when you process it, you know, a cow has four stomachs. When it goes from one stomach to the next, to the next, to the next, you know, the milkshake or whatever it is, once it gets through there, it comes out as something. And what does it come out in the New Testament as? Be like children. Be like children. And this be like children was a word to his disciples. So a disciple is someone who postures himself like a child in their learning. Verse 2 says, Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children. Turning from your sins. What do you mean? That's rough places smooth. That's crooked places straight. Rough places smooth. Crooked places straight means turn from your sins. And, and you know, I, I know our generation hasn't heard a lot about repentance, but repentance means to turn away from something. Amen? I think a lot of times we've heard about, well, believe God, believe the gospel, believe, believe, but it is actually repent and believe. Yes. Amen? It's repent and believe. No, God, I want all of this and I want to believe too. No, no, we're going to, we're going to, all right, there, that's better. We're going to repent and we're going to turn from our wicked ways. Amen? Yes. Amen. You turned over that way so you can turn away from it too. Now, you might say, God, God, give me power to break free from it. That's one thing. But he's like, I want your heart. If I can get your heart to turn away, I will break the power of it. Yes. See how that works? Some people just sit over here, well, God hadn't turned my heart yet. God hadn't turned my heart yet. You have the power to turn your heart. Yes. That's what repentance is. Turn around. Lord, I don't want this anymore. Lord, I don't want this anymore. If he preaches past five minutes, I'm laying on my face on the altar until you break this. I want out. I want freedom. I, want, I don't care who's looking at me. I want to be free. I, I'm turning from all of those things that displease you. If I took you to James chapter 4, James was one of, this is not Peter, James, John that wrote the book of James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. And so this James in chapter 4, you can read it, I believe it's between 4, 6 through 7 down there. And it actually talks about weeping, howling, and mourning. And I, I know this is something we hear all the time, but we should feel bad for sinning. We, we, we sh you should feel bad for sinning. You, it, sh it should not feel good to be like, oh, that's too bad. God hadn't changed my heart yet. Your problem. No, there should, should be something that says, God, I don't want to displease you. I don't want to be against your plans. And in order to be a disciple, a disciple is someone who has turned from their wicked ways. I think sometimes when we use Old Testament terms like the popular, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 that talks about repentance, talks about the repentance amongst God's people, how it can shift a nation. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You hear that? Seek my face and what? Turn from their wicked ways. Seek my face and what? Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I forgive their sins and I will hear from heaven. So we're, we're, we're not just saying God 
give me, give me all of your plans, there's a turning that takes place. And in Matthew chapter 18, he says, turn from your sins and become like little children. Learn like little children. Come to me like little children. And what I love about being a believer for 30 years now is I feel more hungry for God than I ever was before. And so I, I, I want to tell you that, you know, people used to live to close to a thousand years. <laughs> you know, the Bible says of Enoch that he walked with God and was not, you know, because he had a testimony of pleasing God. You mean for like 300 straight years, you were just getting closer and closer and learning more and more and more and more. You, 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 your lifetime isn't long enough to discover him. Amen. So disciples are hungry. Disciples posture in a way that they are teachable. Yes. Yes. They're, they're teachable and they're hungry. It's not hard to teach a disciple. Amen? Amen. It's not hard to teach someone who's hungry to learn. How hard is it to give someone food who's already hungry? Have you ever seen someone asking and begging for food or something like that, and you hand them something, they're like, I don't want that. You know what my mama would say? Child, you ain't hungry. Right? But a disciple is hungry. A disciple is hungry. Our walks with God are actually dependent a lot on us to be hungry to desire, to want to learn, and to stay humble like a child. He said, I'll tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, how can the church ever be one when you have a bunch of humble children seeking God together. Yeah. So Clarence, we got disunity on our missions team. Well, someone's lost the posture. Stay hungry, stay childlike, amen? And that's how we remain disciples. God, I wanna be made a disciple, then turn from your sins, be like a child. You know, there was a, a Pharisee named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night in John chapter three. And if you read the, the verse, you'll, you'll see in the story that Jesus, I mean, he lights him up real good. He lights him up real good. He starts talking about being born again. I'm sure you've heard the term born again. In the translation, it actually says in other versions, be born from above or be born from heaven. And so he's talking about the new birth experience. And he starts talking about spiritual things. And Nicodemus just does not get it. He said, you know, born again, what do you mean by born again? Do I have to go into my mother's womb and come out again? And Jesus just blasts him. He said, are you like a, a master teacher in Israel and you don't understand this? I mean, he just came right down the road. And it would even seem mean. I mean, just, just like, wow, Jesus, I didn't know you would hit people like that. You know, don't you know who he is? You, you would have probably said this in front of folks if you were, Jesus, that was hard. But you know what was happening? Jesus was giving him an opportunity to be humble. It was an opportunity. And someone who was ready to be a disciple would have been like, Jesus, thank you so much for now helping me to understand all the Bible verses I've memorized that have never translated into me being able to be someone who can recognize the Messiah sitting here talking to me. There's a lot of people that know the Bible, but one of the ways you know the Word of God is you begin to understand not God in history, but God now. My sheep know my voice and a stranger they won't follow. Why are you starting? Why is your household starting to do X, Y, Z? I don't know just now, but I just sense God's voice leading me in a direction. So it's about hearing. A disciple humbles himself to hear uh, what the master is saying. I want to give one more. Uh, Luke chapter 5. I love this encounter uh, that Peter had with Jesus and being a disciple. Because again, I'm giving you some examples of Isaiah 40, 3 through 5, translated in what it means to be, to make a disciple. Make a disciple. 
What does it mean to bring the mountains down? Bring the mountains down and say, hey, Nicodemus, take what you thought you understood about the Messiah and, and bury it. Amen? Because Nicodemus is standing here, and he's, out of all the Pharisees, give him a little credit because he did come to Jesus because he knew he saw something. Now, the other Pharisees were too proud. They just fought with him the whole time. I mean, no miracle could change the way that the Pharisees were thinking, but Nicodemus, at least he came. And so Jesus tried to give him an opportunity. He said, if you can get past this rebuke, it'll make you have to go low enough. But do you think with all of his, his outfits on, he would humble himself and start walking behind Jesus with the rest of the disciples? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? You, you think he just, he just would lay down his robe and lay, lay down his position and just start following? But disciples follow. And that's why Jesus didn't waste a lot of time there. And he gave him the truth. Here's the encounter with a disciple who followed. Listen to this story. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee... Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, everybody say that. But if you say so. God, I've been working this job for 15 years and you're telling me to transition. But what? But if you say so. I'll let down the nets again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boats, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Do you see the difference between his response and Nicodemus' response? He was able to acknowledge, I see something. And he was able to humble himself. He was able to bring himself low and this is the one that God chose to be the leader of the first church. So it says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man, for he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. So again, you see that the top three disciples, they were in partnership before Jesus came along. Did y'all know that? They all knew each other. So God can still use relationships that pre-exist, and he gives all of us the opportunity to be disciples. I want to make my way to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, to really talk about who they are. And if you pull the five circles uh, image up here, I'm going to work my way towards that. So in the Gospels... All right, can we say the gospel, starting with Matthew, the first five books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, John, Acts. All right, somebody, I know you can keep going. Some of you need the song behind it to get to the revelations. But I want you to hear uh, this language. So one thing that is super helpful for your own life, uh, for your household, uh, for discipling a group, Terms matter. Terms, language matters. And so we want to invite this whole house to use the term disciple. Use the term disciple. Because being a disciple matters. It matters to use Bible language. Okay, so in the book of Matthew, the term disciple is used 73 times, 46 times in Mark, 37 times in Luke, and 78 times in the book of John. So in total, that's like, if I got, have my math right, 234 times in the Gospels, the term disciple is used. In the book of Acts, the term disciple is used 30 times. 
And then in the letters, okay, so you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the Gospels. Then you have Acts right here, 30 times disciple is mentioned. And then from Romans on to Revelations, you don't have disciple mentioned one time. Okay? All right, now, now let's do that with the term church. In the Gospels, the term church is used three times. Versus 234 times the term disciple. Church three times, 234 to disciple. Then you get in the book of Acts, it says disciple 30 times, and it says church 19 times. So you can see how it's disciple into the practice, and then it's church start building up. So the church is a house of? Hey. Amen? Now, here's my invitation for us to use disciples even instead of just Christians. So in, in, in Acts, it says at Antioch, I mean, of all people who should use Christians should be people who <laughs> in the Antioch movement. But said, at Antioch was where they were first called Christians. Now, I'm not against the term, but any body of believers, we use, you use certain language because it defines who you are. Don't be around a bunch of friends who just call you any kind of name. That means you're not clear on who you are. You ask, what people call you will help you know who you should be hanging around. Now, we say spend time, go out into the world, be around those who need Christ, go into those spaces, and that's where we want to live. But I'm more talking about your inner circle, the people who lift you up, the people who pray over you, prophesy over you, remind you of God's promises. That circle of people, they're supposed to know who you are in Christ. They're supposed to remind you of who you are in Christ. They're supposed to surround you and lift you up just like you have a baby sapling, a, a little baby tree, and it has a stake here and a stake there, and it's tied, and it's tied so it'll stand up, right? And sometimes you have to be tied until you grow into your height in Christ, but that's who surrounds you, amen? Yeah. Jesus did it. No one on earth could understand who he was. Some people had glimpses of who he was. Anna met him at his birth. Simon met him at his birth, or Simeon met him at his birth. But for the most part, who really knew who Jesus was and what his potential was? So since he didn't have that around him, the closest people he let to them were those who were the hungriest. Not people who are going to be walking behind and talking, hey, Jesus, are you sure you want to go this way? Jesus, are you sure you want to go that way? You know, because people, even, even though they don't have a prayer life with God, they have a confidence. Their mountains haven't been brought down where they would dare tell Jesus what to do next. His own brothers were telling them, hey, don't go up to the, f why don't you just start a Facebook page? Come on, Jesus. <laughs> if, you, if you're who you say you are, go on out and tell everybody. And Jesus just sent them on up to the feast because he knew, don't take advice from people who don't know God. Because they're going to discern you in a carnal way. They're going to be like, hey, why'd you do that? Or why are you going on a trip to a foreign country? What do you mean you're going to move uh, overseas? What's wrong with you? You just got a degree that you paid $40,000 for, and now you're telling me you're going to go overseas just to share the gospel with a bunch of kids in prison? <laughs> to the human mind, it makes no sense. But to the kingdom mind, he knows that's the way you begin to actually save nations. Yeah. Ninety-eight times from Romans on, you see the term church. So the church is a group of Christians is okay. Don't go start a doctrine and put it online. Antioch doesn't believe Christians are not disciples. I didn't say that. I'm just saying for a family, you want to have language that means something to you. We make disciples. We make disciples. We're not satisfied if you're a great tither. We make disciples. Amen? We're not satisfied if you just have great attendance. We make disciples. 
someone where God can breathe in a direction and they can say, oh, I'm going there. Or thank you, Lord. I'm going to sit here for a while. You've been done eating for a while. Why are you still? For some reason, I feel like God wants me to stay. Their hearts are yielded to obedience. Yes. Obey. You can throw a little bit of child training in if you really understand discipleship. I didn't teach my children to tell me what flavor of food they liked between the ages of zero and two. I don't care what food you like. I need to know that if I'm trying to save your life, I can say your name once and you'll stop and come. I don't, need to, I don't have time to come explain to you why I need you to stop something at the oddest and wrong time. This ain't, no, daddy's a disciple of God and you're my disciple, like it or not. <laughs> Amen. Amen? Amen? But you tell a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old, a 60-year-old, or a 70-year-old Christian that the first thing that's a sign of your true relationship with God is not actually your intellect, it's your obedience. Man. When Christians that really know God explain their relationship to you, they do what me and my brother used to do after we got, got we called them whoopings back in the day, spankings. We start comparing our stripes. <laughs> my, my mama could lay it on there, boy. <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me up in here. It wasn't abuse. DHS, it wasn't abuse. <laughs> but it was training us Decision, consequence, decision, consequence. I'm going to give you a consequence now, so the consequence out there that could take your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But uh, disciples learn obedience. So I, I want to give just a couple minutes here something I just think is so beautiful. There's a couple terms that we use today, just so you know how we use these terms here, discipling and mentoring. Discipling is biblical. Mentoring is biblical. Discipling is biblical. Mentoring is biblical. But I want to give you a distinction here. When we talk about discipleship in this family, in this house, we're talking about someone asking for counsel and advice, and we're saying, here's what the Word says. 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 Well, how did you handle it? Well, I just felt like... You're not going to listen to what? Okay, unless your feelings are going to land on a Bible verse. Because see, all this feeling talk has left us with 60% divorce rate. Y'all ain't helping me. Angry folks, church hopping, can't commit, can't keep covenant with any group of people to know you, to love you, to stay with you through trials and through different season. No, rooted is a, an example of believers. When persecution hit, the church of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8, the whole church scattered, but the apostles stayed right there in Jerusalem. Yeah. It's like a captain going down with the ship. They're like, nope, we're staying right here. Yeah. There's something that's built in you that reflects the kingdom, steadfast, um, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, bearing fruit in all seasons. That's discipleship. Trained to behave beyond your emotions. Some of you, some of us, you were raised in an emotional household. And so your brain just can't comprehend not giving yourself room to let it all out no matter who you hurt. And then the Word of God comes along and says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Or the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Well, Clarence, I wasn't angry. And I definitely didn't have wrath. So why are you quoting that verse to me? Do you see why you want to use biblical language? Because we hide with our terms. I was just upset. <laughs> it just didn't agree with me. All this Christianese language to cover up wrath, <laughs> anger. Amen? But why do we get together? You, you, you don't need someone who's prayed for 40 hours a week to recognize anger. Ask a child. When you tell that child to go over, hey, go give so-and-so a hug, they're like, <laughs> they're no good in what? Like, I don't know what's wrong right here. He's smiling or his face is straight, but something's not right. You don't need, and that's why we do life groups. 
So five circles, if you throw those up right there. This is where we produce disciples. Number one, a disciple you cannot exchange. The first one, me and Jesus. This is your time with God in his word and in worship, me and Jesus. That cannot be replaced with any other circle. Not your discipleship time, not circle number three, life group time or house church time. Number four, church gathered, which is what we're doing right now, or even going to the nations. If you do any of the other four circles and you stop doing number one, it's like trying to have a plant even in a greenhouse that's not being watered. You want to have a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. Amen? So disciple making in two and three, that's a lot of what we're talking about right here. Jesus had tears of discipleship. Tears, not in E-A-R-S, people that made a leader cry, but tears, T-I-E-R-S, that he had the Peter, James, and John, and he had them like in groups of three. How many in here are asking yourself even now, God, am I your disciple? God, do you have my life under obedience? Have I made your plans mine? Let me close with Matthew chapter 28, um, and we'll wrap up right here. This is our mission statement. This is the vision statement for anybody who's in Christ. It's just for anybody who's in Christ, bottom line. Oh, dear. We went long today, didn't we? (laughs) Y'all, we need to close. Okay, let me wrap this up. I didn't realize what time it was. All right. We worship long today, which is good. Okay, Jesus came and told his disciples, two minutes, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and do what? Do what? Do what? Make disciples of all the nations, not some, all the nations. Nations can be a nation state, but it really means people, every people group. So your world should not be homogenous baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right, so so let me share with you why I want you to have confidence in the way you've chosen in being a believer. Our commission, every Believer, every disciple, all of us who make up the church, our commission is to do that verse right there, to take this message to every nation so we are God's solution to every nation. No matter what your profession might be, we are what he said to do. He said, now go teach them my ways. Teach every politician, teach every lawyer, teach every professional, teach every teacher, Teach every educator, every principal, every superintendent. Teach them my ways. This is for every disciple to do in every sphere. Clarence, what happens? Why is the world so unrighteous? Either someone refused to be taught or someone sent to teach was not doing their job. Or a little bit of both. So my prayer today is that everyone in this room will catch your assignment. You're like, well, Clarence, I don't know if I'm called to leave my job right now. Well, that's where it comes to be a sheep and hear his voice. If you work nine to five, you're like, well, I don't have room to share the gospel on the job. Then raise resources to help send others out to do it. When she took that alabaster box and laid it at Jesus' feet, she made it a part of the kingdom so that everything we're doing is driving towards the vision of discipling all nations. It's not sin that has raised up. It is light that has not shined. And he didn't say make church people of all nations. He said make disciples of all nations. Everybody stand. Praise God. We're going to dismiss this morning. If you desire prayer this morning, we are over time. So before I get in trouble with the (laughs) children's team, um, if you're here in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, I'll make it super, super clear for you in 10 seconds. Only one name conquered death, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
only one. And when you die and all the other prophets that have been named die, there will be one person standing there. He has paid for all of our sins. It is a gift to us. Now that it's a gift, to reject the gift would be rebellion. It's a gift, but to say, God, I don't care if you died on the cross, I push away from it. And people ask me, even this week, well, if God is so good, then why in the world do all these bad things happen? Because disciples, obedience level might be here, but his voice has been telling us to do all the, How many things has God asked us to do that we just can't hear him saying it to us? Friend, it's God that loves us. It's God that loves you. So let's be the people who make room for God. And it starts with you giving your life to Jesus. Ministry team, come on forward. If you're in this room and you need prayer for healing, or if you want to give your life to Jesus, don't leave this room today without giving your heart to him. So Father, we thank you for everyone in this room, every household, that we won't just be Christians, that we are disciples in this room. Lord, send us, lead us, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.